Okay, let's talk to church leaders. Now, uh, I'm taking some of this content from some material that you've written, uh, which I love. So I want to dive into some of it. So um, you've written about several important things to keep in mind when planning um, to help kids especially experience God through music. Okay, so the first one is relevant music and appeal, uh, that we should select music that appeals to their ears in the world that they're living in. Um, Will you expound on that? Does that mean no hymns? What does that mean? (laughs) <laughs> no, I, no, I think, I think it really comes down to sonic choices, yeah. you yeah, know, style. um, great songs are forever great songs. Um, and you know, we've seen it evidenced time and time again, as, as random people, you know, do a cover of a song from days gone by, like you can reinvent and put a new outfit on a great song to make it sound like it's 2019, you know, or whatever year you're in. So, um, so the copyright on a song doesn't really mean anything to me unless you've been stuck doing that song 50 Sundays of the year for the past 20 years. Right. (laughs) You know, then I'm going to be like, yeah, you really need to stop, you know? Yeah. But, um, you know, if it's pulling it out, here and there, you know, and using a song from, from days gone by, like that can be a really awesome special moment. I liken it to, you know, your favorite sweatshirt or, right. you know, jeans or, you know, thing that has been in your closet that you've had with you for a lifetime, it feels like. And you pull out that article of clothing or that special blanket or whatnot. And it just is like, this is home and this is mm-hmm. my happy place. And I think certain songs, you know, in the church are that, you know, it's yeah. like a musical version of that. So it's not that I'm saying they should go away. I would say, you know, there's a lot of kids music that's out there that um, is incredibly hokey and incredibly painful to listen to. Yep. Um, and so I try really hard through the music that I make and create to make sure it sounds like music you know, I want it to sound normal and still, you know, have a artistic presence about it. And the thing where people can be like, yeah, that's enjoyable. Like, that's not annoying to listen to. Yeah. Um, and the difference for me is it's not that I have to dumb things down and make something be corny and cheesy musically in order to make it work. What changes for me is the vocabulary that's in my songs and the bite sized piece of the lyric or the arrangement of the song to help that age group get it, you know, to make sure I'm not shoving a five minute long song down a three-year-old's, you know, Uh worship experience. Um, That doesn't work. So for me, the change is lyrically, you know, my songs may be simpler than if I was intentionally writing a song for adult congregations to sing, Mm -hmm. you know, it may mean there's one verse that you repeat again, as opposed to having a different lyric, you know, for verse two, whatever that looks like, you know, it may just mean simplifying the arrangement. Um, but I, I am truly Carl, I am burdened to try to help make church experiences sound and look a whole lot more like what Monday through Saturday looks and sounds like in someone's life. Uh, You know, obviously the Jesus factor is the difference ingredient there, but it's, it's bizarrely strange to me (laughs) that so many churches put on this thing that I'm like, like, are these people listening to this, you know, in their car throughout the week, you know, like, is this really what they have playing in the background while they're working? You know, it's just like, right. I, I seriously doubt so. And I, this year, even in the past few months, like have really been on a, I don't know, even more intense journey with this conversation inside my head. I, as a couple examples, like I went to the Toby Mac concert in town and honestly, it's the first time I've seen Toby, Toby perform live probably about, I don't know, eight, nine years. So it's been a little while. And, you know, I grew up on DC Talk, so, you know, I'm familiar with the career that existed before the current one. Mm -hmm. And um, I, as I looked around the arena here in Nashville, I couldn't believe how many people were there, not with children, 
and not with grandchildren that I know are way older than myself. I mean, I'm talking about people that had to at least be 50 years old and up. And they were there at the Toby Mac show with their cell phone in the air, you know, yes. taking photos and videos and the whole thing. And I'm like, they're not here with a kid. They're not here with their grandchild. You know, like this couple just came because they like this music. And yet they probably, in most cases, go to a church that musically sounds so different right from what happened here you know but i'm it's just and then i don't know a month or so later i went and saw um pink here in nashville and the same thing like i'm looking around and i'm like these people are way older than me you know and yeah. they are here they came to see pink which is i mean she's always been a punk you know it's this beautiful blend of rock pop you know R&B soul, like concoction or whatever. And I'm like, these people are here. Like they bought yeah. a ticket and they're here. And yet so often what the church says, this age group and older, you know, wants is something that sounds so different from what these people are buying a concert ticket to go see. Right. And honestly, that is why that you hit on the exact reason why we minister to churches to help them with their worship experience. But I have on the podcast, not just church staff members, mm -hmm. but like in the past week, I've had Greg Long from Avalon yeah. and, and uh, Billy Goodwin from New Song and Rebecca St. I mean, w Christian music artists, because they are creating worship experiences in their concerts. That's what yeah. it is. And so I want church people to learn from artists mm -hmm. on how sure. to create experiences because yeah. it, it needs to come over some. I think, oh, yeah. In my yeah. And, you know, and in performing, you know, culture, like there's, there's stage performance consultants and whatnot, you know, that you hire, that make a very, very nice daily rate. And these people, I mean, what they do and what they're, they're, craft is is deciding hey here's where you speak in the song here's where you nice. engage the audience in the song you come over here and you stand here you know for this verse and then you move and um what i think and and once you learn some of those skills of the trade and stuff too then it's very obvious for you to go and watch someone perform where you know like they know nothing about this you know and it's a free-for-all random and then the people that are intentional with it but um there's a reason why great artists that are really great at connecting with their audience. I mean, Garth Brooks, as an example, you know, like we know, like he's a phenomenal um, entertainer. And it's like there are things that he does that are just like stage one on one of getting audience, embracing your audience, yeah. inviting them to the party yeah, and giving them something to take part in. Yeah. Yeah. And the same applies on Sunday morning. Um, and let me just say this because it's it's crossed my mind a couple of times um, in the conversation and not knowing where we're going next. It may not come up again. But when I look at when I look at scripture and again, I, I look back to David's writings and Psalms, he was very specific to tell us what to do and how to do it. OK, so like just a quick example. So Psalm 47 one says, come, everybody, clap your hands, shout with joyful songs to God. And yeah. so in a very short verse, he gave us four pieces of instruction. He mm -hmm. said, come everybody, you're going to, you're going to clap your hands. You're going to shout to God and you're going to do it with a smile on your face. And especially getting into adult worship cultures, I think, I think so many people kind of missed the boat to realize that Hey, people, it's not that they're intentionally thinking, I don't want to take part in this worship service. Like that is not that they're just all standing there thinking like, how do I boycott what this person is trying to make me do? You know, like right. that's right. not it. Oftentimes it's like, they're thinking about stuff that's going on at work. They're thinking yeah. about the other things that they've got to do as a family later today. Mm -hmm. You know, they're going through some sort of crisis, like 
a fly flew by in front of their vision and distracted them, you know, Mm -hmm. or a person talking two rows back, like, you know, the same stuff happens. And it's, it's not that they're thinking, how do I not take part in worship today? They oftentimes need someone to just remind them, Hey, come everybody. I want y'all to clap your hands right now. We're going to sing to the Lord because he's the one that gives us victory in our life. And we can do it regardless of what's going on in our life. You know, we can do it with a smile on our face, even on the hardest day, because we know that God is faithful. And I think more worship leaders need to go back and look at David's example and look at how he led us, the generations of Christ followers, for thousands of years in worship. Um, through his writings, and then figure out how to do that with your congregation on Sunday. So what if someone's listening and saying, uh, uh, but I don't want to, we're not trying to create a concert here. This isn't a concert experience. This is a worship service. Yeah. Yeah. What would you tell them that, you know, maybe there are, in my opinion, there are some elements and pieces that we can learn from great artists. The yeah. experience doesn't have to look exactly the same, yeah. but there are some key things that you can do, how you craft it, where you place stuff, things like that, that mm-hmm. we can learn from, even if you're a traditional worship setting. Would you Correct. agree with that? Yes, I would definitely agree with that. Um, it comes down to doing the best job you can do to engage your audience and, you know, your audience could be a boardroom, you know, it could be Mm. a concert arena. It could be a traditional sanctuary. It could be a classroom, you know, like uh, Dr. Henry Cloud a long time ago, he said, a good teacher knows when their audience is getting it and when they're not. Mm -hmm. And a good teacher goes back to the drawing board to figure out what to do and change to help them get it. Right. Yeah, yeah. And that applies to us. So a great storyteller, you know, some of the same characteristics are the same between a great teacher, a great pastor, a great storyteller and a kid's classroom, a worship leader. It all comes down to I'm connecting with a group of people and I'm helping them to better understand a concept. Right. And I'm giving them as worship leaders, we're giving them an opportunity to go ahead and try this out right here and right now. You know, you don't have to leave church and get into your car, get back home to then be like, okay, go and try this worship thing. It's like, here's your moment. Um, But I think those characteristics are the same regardless of the role. Yeah. Or the style. Mm -hmm. Um, Okay. So let's, let's get into back into kind of church leader stuff, talking to church leaders. So you've shared, you've shared with church leaders before to be fun, but not to be silly. Mm-hmm. Okay, so the, the, there's a difference between songs that are fun and energetic and songs that are silly and hokey. We talked about it a, a little bit. Yeah. So why do you think kids can handle, especially let's talk to kids worship. How, why do you think that kids can handle authentic worship? Uh, because they do. I, if, if you've ever experienced a, a group of kids that are just really singing from their heart to the Lord. If you walk in on a room of kids, you know, singing anything from how great is our God to who you say I am to oceans. And it's just like their eyes are closed. They are all in. Like it will bring a tear to your eye when you walk into a classroom where you see that taking place. Um, The Bible says in Psalm 8, 1 and 2 in the message translation, God, brilliant Lord, yours is a household name. Nursing infants gurgle choruses about you, and toddlers shout the songs that drown out atheist babble. And I think you can, you know, insert and change from toddler or infant to, you know, an attitude filled fifth grader, you know, (laughs) or, you know, um, I think, I think we can adapt the ages a little bit there. But what I know is true is that there is power in our kids' worship. And that scripture reminds me that, you know, there's people in all of our lives that we know we have a relationship with um, that aren't where they need to be in a relationship with the Lord. And that verse reminds me that those people experiencing a group of kids in our congregations that are all in worshiping the Lord, um, doing what God created them to do 
can help those people even that have that label of atheists, you know, those people that do not believe at all what they need to about who God is and, and his love for them. Um, stop in their tracks and think, get, give that a second thought. And I, for me, that's exciting because I realized like every church has an opportunity when they open the doors of their building, when they open up those classrooms and they check in a group of kids by pushing play on a few songs and giving their kids an opportunity to sing and to celebrate and to shout joyfully before the Lord and lift up holy hands to the Lord to worship and draw close to him. We are igniting a power to be at work in the lives of our kids, their families, and our community. Um, and so for me, it's just a no brainer. Like, why would you not want that to be happening in your classrooms? Um, kids just, they really, um, they really get worship again. It kind of, I said it at the beginning, but it's drawing a box. And just helping them to understand this is what this time is about. This is what it's not about. This is how you take part in it. And then helping them take baby steps, you know, um, throughout your VBS, throughout your camp, you know, every Sunday, maybe set a bar um, weekly, monthly, quarterly, but something where it's like, hey, we want to help our kids, kids get to here this week through our worship experiences and, and then meet about that and evaluate it and, and just really try to help the things that you do to be pointing back and helping kids take a step and better understand and better engage in worship at this part and stage of the journey. How do you teach kids how to respond to slower songs? Um, well, for one, you've got to do them. You know, I've talked to leaders before that say, well, we don't do slow worship songs because our kids don't know how to respond to them, you know? And I always think like, That's your fault. I, can't, I know. I'm like, <laughs> I, I wish I was like Judy Hopps and Zootopia. She had a little reporter pen, you know, she would all of a sudden play you back a voice recording what she said. <laughs> and it's like, you know, sometimes it's like Captain Obvious here. Like, yeah. uh, did, have you ever thought about what you just said? Like, sometimes we problem solve our own issues in life just by talking out loud. Yeah. Um, so, you know, it's, it means you start with one, you know, and maybe you start and you even let them sit down during it, you know, just to kind of get them used to it. Um, but you start giving them the opportunity and, you know, for me, um, when I go into a camp or something like that, beginning of the week, you know, it's a bunch of kids from a bunch of different churches that all have completely different worship experiences of what they do and what might be normal for them. So it definitely starts a little bit more with like, okay, we got to corral, we got to corral the animals here yeah. and we've got to, you know, explain and point the way and then keep building with each session that I have them. And, and it's amazing even what the difference of, you know, four services, you know, three services, like, what that can start looking like. Yeah. Um, but it's just teaching little by little, you know, I, I think every week give your kids something, um, related to, I like to say the what, why, where, when, and how of worship, you know, every week just help them understand what it is and why we're doing it. Um, share a personal story, if, it, if a certain song relates to you or you've had an aha moment in your life or, you know, a testimony of how a certain message has impacted you. Like, I think what that looks like from week to week is a little bit different. Um, but I think it's really important. Don't just do songs, but keep planting seeds and pl keep um, taking steps to help in your kids engage yeah. in worship. Good. Okay, in our last few minutes, let's talk about how to develop a kid's worship team. Um, okay, so how do you, where do you start? How do you handle rehearsals and practice? And can, can kids really lead worship? Like, give me a, give me a couple minutes on that. Um, yeah, I mean, I think it's great. There's, uh, there's so many different ways that you can slice it. You know, I've, yeah. I've been a part of things that had weekly rehearsals. I've been a part of things that had monthly rehearsals. I think knowing the age group you're talking about um, and how many songs you're going to do um, 
will dictate which one of those it needs to be. Um, you know, I've been in certain uh, seasons where it's like, if there was enough ongoing stuff that was repetitive throughout the year, then maybe you don't have to have such intense rehearsals, but you do something monthly just to teach what that new song um, and you're going to only have probably one or two of those per month for kids in the first place is help people get on board with that. Um, I think as far as, uh, well, ultimately for me, I just say it should be something where they're joining a team, they're making some sort of a commitment. There are some rehearsals and some requirements to be involved. I've never been one of those people that just says, okay, who wants to help us out with worship right now and pick a few random people from the audience. Um, I'm never going to do that because for one, I want these people to understand, even if they're, you know, a kid's worship team, they have a responsibility here. The moment they step foot on that platform, they are a leader and they are an example. And um, as a worship team, like what we are really is just an example to our audience. We're positive peer pressure to show people what worship might look like, how they might engage along with this. I mean, it's kind of like casting that mirror reflection, like painting the picture, like this is how you do it. And this is what it looks like. And, um, and so if I'm just picking people randomly from the audience to help me out, even in a kid's class, like I can never put that kind of stuff into them. So I think having an organized ministry and team is really important. So you can teach them and train them up and help them, um, realize their responsibility as leaders. But even, um, I mean, as far as worship leaders, especially if you have preteen kids, um, a, pre a preteen class or a really struggling with getting boys connected with what you're doing in elementary worship, I would challenge you like find a way to get some high school boys, some college age guys, um, some people that those fifth and sixth grader boys are going to look at and be like, Hey, I want to be like them. You know, like right. if they can do this, if it's cool yeah. enough for them to do it, then I can worship God too. I can lift up my hand. Yeah. Um, so again, it kind of gets back to what we talked about earlier too, that conversation with a student ministry pastor, you know, Hopefully your kids' service and student ministry service aren't happening at the exact same time because then this can really work to your advantage even better. Um, but it's like I, I tell people, like, go talk to your student pastor. Like, find out who those people are in their ministry that are like myself, who it's like they love music and they want to do it. And, yeah. like, this is this is their thing. And every single one of us, even the, I mean, the most talented people in the world still need opportunities. They still need reps on stage to get up there, play their instrument, sing their song, learn how to talk to an audience. I mean, I say that because, I mean, for some singers, that is like scared out of their mind kind of stuff. You know, they may be a great mm -hmm. singer, but to think about, oh my gosh, you want me to talk? You want me to share something? Right. You know, like that's just not, that's not necessarily what people that are great singers, you know, have spent their life doing before. So, you know, talk to those student ministry pastors and find out who are some of those kids that like have a hunger to do this, have a desire to do it. And they just need opportunities given to them because kids worship may be a great way for them to develop their, their skill set a little bit more. Right. I think that's a good point that if, if this, if student ministry can help lead not only lead, but train and teach the kids, mm -hmm. then you're, that's a, that's a total win for both places too. Yeah. Do you, do you still like if, if kids are learning instruments or they're learning, you know, and it could be a disaster, um, do you still play with tracks until they can get up to speed or what's the transition yeah. that you use to get them there? Well, I mean, I think, you know, oftentimes in children's ministry, people are using pre-recorded music and, you know, the, for those people that want to do some live music, want to do a band, um, I I often will tell people because, you know, maybe they're like, I don't have a full band. You know, like I've got this one guitar player. I've got this guy that can play some percussion, you know, like, and it's realizing too, like you can take some steps to add a live element without having a full band that's capable of doing the whole thing in place. So that may look like... Um, Still using a track for your upbeat 
high energy songs because that's really hard to create recreate with just an acoustic guitar. Right. It's not even really hard. It's like impossible. Like mm-hmm. you're never going to create that much energy and enthusiasm. So use the track for those and then kind of ease into it with your mid tempo or your slower worship songs. Then do that with the live element because you can get away with doing a worship song with one or two instruments and it's not going to feel like, Hey, we're really missing so many pieces here. Mm -hmm. Um, and I mean, with, like you were saying, if you've got some people that it's like, they're still learning guitar or keyboard or whatnot, then I would totally say like, yeah, let's just use it. Yeah. Play with the track, Mm -hmm. you know? And it's like visually, visually you're going to take some steps forward. People are going to feel like, Oh, there's people up there. They're doing this. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's so hard for us sometimes as musician people, even media people to realize that, um, so often so many people in the audience will be clueless to the fact that it really isn't all happening up on stage. You know, right. it's, right. it's sometimes scary how much normal people don't get and understand how that works. So there's a lot of people that completely don't understand that. Yeah. So you can definitely take some steps there. And then too, you know, there's resources like with multitracks.com and whatnot. I've got yeah. some of my songs there. So, you know, there you're getting the stems, you can, mm-hmm. you know, kind of do that custom mix thing. So mm-hmm. maybe you have a drummer and maybe you have a guitar player, you know, mm-hmm. you can build you the custom mix track and use all the other pieces that are there and just take out, you know, two those two things and, and do a hybrid thing as well that way. So you hit on media a little bit. How much media content do you use in your experiences and speak to, should I use more? Should I use less? What are the best pieces of media to use? Stuff like that. Well, I mean, I use video for everything I do. So, um, and, and my concerts and my worship experiences, I'm using lyric video, you know, motion graphic pieces for everything. I think it, I mean, I definitely think it adds a whole lot. You know, I, I, I still think you can do it the dumbed down way a little bit, you know, get a motion graphic background happening and, do manual words, you know, triggering verse by verse, course by course. You can do that. You know, there's there's maybe times that I start introducing a song that I haven't made all that stuff for before, and that's going to be the route mm-hmm. that I'm going to go. Um, I think it's important, you know, to definitely just include that stuff and and have it up there on the screen. I I think it I think it adds something, but. Um, and then, you know, in most kids' classrooms, they're going to be using pre-recorded music, you know, and even right. with the original lead vocal in most cases, right. you know, there's right. Right. there's a lot of um, kids' worship teams that are out there that they do have some worship leaders and some people, but they still just sing along to the full mix of, and don't even use the track without the lead vocal. So, so why should I, if I'm a children's pastor, if I'm a uh, worship leader of any kind at a church, Why do I need to budget for media content, whether that's lyric videos to your stuff, whether that's creating my own, why do, why does that need to be a a chunk of my budget? Yeah. I mean, I think the, uh, the biggest factor for me goes back to that. I'm burdened to help Sunday morning look a whole lot more like Monday through Saturday. And so, uh, I believe music is a tool that we have in ministry, but I also think the video, visual, sonic elements that we have, it's just another tool. It's just another resource that we have in our arsenal to help point and shine a light and say, this is the way. Mm -hmm. And so, um, so that's why for me, I'm, you know, it's a necessity. Um, I think church leaders, need a budget for it. And because the alternatives all are illegal (laughs) in the way for them to get it in their hands. Um, and I'm a fan of the Bible and I'm a fan of the 10 commandments and says thou shalt not steal. And so I'm going to budget for those things because I want to honor the gifts that are in others and the companies, the individuals, the producers, musicians, writers, artists, singers, 
video segment producers, all those people that invested time and energy and funds in order to create this thing that individual churches are getting for such Mm -hmm. pennies on the dollar for what it actually took to create that. And so by working together, we all can benefit and really, um, you know, gain. And so, um, yeah. So we've, we've chatted about this before. So let, let's just hit the bullseye where it's at. So a lot of people, okay. uh, a, a lot of uh, kids ministries or other churches will go on YouTube. Mm-hmm. They'll find a piece by you or someone. They'll rip it from YouTube and play it in their kids' worship experience. So mm-hmm. that is illegal. And it does not serve you, me, a ministry that, uh, you know, that creates this content doesn't serve us well because we need to, one, make a living. And we also want to serve more churches. I mean, I think yeah. our heart's in the right place to to do that. Yeah. Um, and so we need the resources to be able to do that. So do you think a lot of people just don't know that it's illegal to do that? I think, I think in most cases... Yes, people are naive and just don't even realize. Um, you know, we we hit the agree button on things on our computer, you know, new software updates, licenses, random websites, whatnot. We agree to the terms of use all day long without ever reading the fine print. Um, I've actually gone through the fine print of YouTube and YouTube Red um, and you cannot use it for group use, you know, it's the truth of the matter. And on the flip side, you know, there is monetization that does Mm -hmm. happen on YouTube where there are, there is money floating around out there from all those ads. Um, I call it millipennies because it takes, it takes a whole lot of 0.0000001 things to add up, you know, to be a dollar. Um, Mm -hmm. and any of our accounts that are getting those funds, but what, as soon as you rip it, AKA steal it from YouTube, um, you've cut off that pipeline of funds. So in the first place, there's not group viewing on YouTube. So that's a strike. But then as soon as you rip it and take it from YouTube, you've cut off the funds that are going to the ownership of that media content. Mm-hmm. So by you continuing to use it, you're just using stolen material and stolen yep. goods. And it, it prevents us, like, honestly, we don't put our worship media content on YouTube. Mm-hmm. And I know that you're you're the same way in that you don't put some of your yeah. content on your YouTube channel. Yeah. I uh, we can't. Other people I was going to say, we can't prevent other people from putting that content up on their channels. Um but but that's the reason that we don't is because people will take it down. So I think I, I just want people to hear our heart in that yeah. um, and, and what that means. And, and on the flip side, I just want to say, you know, that I've been a part of chats happening on Facebook before, you know, where someone spoke up and was honest and was like, you know, I don't have budget. And that's why, you know, that's their justification for doing it that way. And the more that I processed that, you know, in the following day or so after seeing that statement, it really, it made me sad because, um, and, and a little extra frustrated and angry because I realized too, I understand that budget is a real issue for yeah. many, many people. Yeah. And there are amazing churches that are out there like your church on the move seeds, like new spring, um, different ones that are making life search, you know, that are making a lot of content available to other churches. So right. if budget is an issue. Number one, you definitely need to go find those free resources that are yeah. out there because of faithful church members and those congregations yeah. um, where they've been able to make this as a gift to the church. But I also realized too, like by someone saying, okay, budget is an issue. So I'm just going to go take something that's not mine. And I'm justified in that because I can't afford to do it. Not only did someone just steal my video, you know, my content, but they also, by not writing me a letter, you know, sending me an email, sending me a Facebook 
message, telling me your story, telling me about your church, your congregation, right. your ministry, and letting me read and process that and respond to the spirit of God within me of when it's time to say, you know what, bless that person, just give right. it to, them. you right. know, like whatnot. If you would be honest and come to so many, you know, we might not be able to give you everything, but I bet there's something that we can give and sow into your ministry. And right. when you just take something that's not yours, um, not only did you take my content, but you stole from me an opportunity for God to bless mm -hmm. my obedience. Good by That's giving good. and sowing it into ministry. So, yep. so then I was, then I was just extra mad because I was like, they stole from me twice. Yeah. You know? I know. I was going to say I the same better, thing. If I you just came to me and talked to me, maybe we can do something about it. Yeah. But, yeah. Okay. I didn't know we were going to go there, but all right, let's wrap up. Um, uh, so as far as worship experiences go, do you have anything else that you want to say concerning worship leaders or worship experiences that would kind of put a bow on our conversation today? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, something that I've said for a long time, and I, I just think it's, it's a worthy reminder for all of us too, is there's freedom and preparation. And so taking the time, have a plan so you can deviate throughout the week and the months in advance to have a plan, you know, take time to pray, be sensitive to, you know, God guiding you as you plan out the songs you're going to do, all that stuff. I've stepped on stage knowing I knew a song like the back of my hand and was confident. And I've also stepped on stage knowing I don't know this as well as I need to. Right. <laughs> Opening my mouth and, you know, the chorus lyrics come out, you know, on top of the verse or something, you know, it's like backwards of how it should have happened. And it's a whole lot more fun. Um, to, to walk out there on stage confident that, you know, your you know, your songs, you know, what you're there to do, you know, what you're there to say. And so there's a lot of freedom that's there when, and, uh, you know, I think you can be a better worship leader when you're not so worried and consumed with, oh, I hope I remember these chords. Hope I don't botch the second verse, you know, all right. of that. Can set, it, allow, it frees you up to just worship and help be aware of your audience in front of you and help them take some steps to get closer to the feet of Jesus mm. um, through your, your worship time that day. So good. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for your time. How can we keep up with you? How can we find your stuff? Um, yeah. So yanceyministries.com is the main site. Um, the heartbeat curriculum we talked about earlier, you can go directly to yanceyministries.com slash heartbeat um, I do music for a lot of ages of kids. I have a series for younger kids called Little Praise Party, um, super popular and well-loved by many churches. So definitely check that out for younger kids. And then for preteen and elementary age, I do a series called Kidman Worship. Um, so you can go to kidmanworship.com. You can go to littlepraiseparty.com. And then all of my content is there at Worship House Media, worshiphousekids.com. So Awesome. And we'll put all that in the show notes to get over to you also. Thanks so much for your time today. Really appreciate it. Thank you.